who is going to formally welcome Maraid. So thank you, Maraid, and uh, welcome, Brian. Goramaga uh, Fiona, do spot them falsha a court of Gokania, a Rajan Higan on the Cafe Ishka Show. Uh, hello and welcome everybody to our first uh, virtual water cafe. Uh, we're particularly delighted to have with us today uh, Maraid McGuinness, MEP, the, the first Vice President of the European Parliament. And I'll have the pleasure in, in, in a minute or two just of formally introducing Maraid um, after, after I've just said a few words of, of introduction. I, I know we're all looking forward to Maraid's contribution, uh, particularly in the context of the Europe, Europe's water resources and especially the European Green Deal. So I think there'll be lots of questions on that. Just a few words, Maraid, on, in terms of what we're doing here at DCU in this context. Uh, we're very proud of the work being done by the Water Institute, which aligns with the university's own commitment to sustainability. Now, lots of people talk about sustainability, but at DCU, it's clearly emphasized and articulated in our own strategic plan, where strategic goal number eight states very simply, we are placing sustainability at the core of the university. It's as stark as that, and it's a very serious commitment, and our associated actions have resulted in DCU being ranked number 12 in the world for each of the past two years in terms of universities and sustainability. This is the green metrics rankings, and uh, we're, we're, we're very proud of that. And um, this Friday, I'll be announcing, but you're getting a sneak preview here, that DCU has been awarded its third green flag. Now, the, the green flags you'd be familiar with in schools, Maria, but for universities, mm -hmm. they have a very high bar mm -hmm. in terms of academic research and operations. We have three campuses in this uh, Drumcondra, Glasnevin region, St. Patrick's campus, All Hallows campus, and Glasnevin campus. We now have a green flag for each of the three campuses, which we're very proud of, but mm -hmm. so no one else knows that apart from yourselves at this stage. So uh, we're very pleased with that. Um, we also um, pride ourselves on being a highly engaged university, the very antithesis of an ivory tower university. And um, we believe that we have a responsibility to create knowledge to advance society. And the Water Institute exemplifies this approach with very clearly defined goals, focusing on safe, secure drinking water, healthy aquatic ecosystems, and reliable energy efficient uh, water supplies for a sustainable economy and all intersecting in the, the energy water nexus in the middle of that as well and all very much aligned with the European Green Deal. But through excellence in research and capacity building, the Water Institute uh, you know, creates and develops real world solutions to national and global problems in water. So even looking as far as low resource uh, environments, for example, across the world. Um, we strongly believe in engagement with stakeholders and believe in the quadruple helix of academia, industry, a government and society and the citizen. A, and that's central to the Institute's work. These monthly water cafes are a very highly effective way, very innovative that we've been able to switch to the virtual environment, but they're a very highly effective model for ensuring continual engagement with that quadruple helix because we believe that's the most effective way forward and the most effective way of ensuring innovation. Um, these water cafes are a welcoming space where academia can communicate its work to industry, policymakers, and public bodies. And through knowledge exchange uh, around water, we can advance the common goal of ensuring that we protect this valuable and finite resource. Um, the work of the Institute is highly relevant to the European Green Deal. Uh, we highlight in, well, in the Green Deal, there's a highlighting of access to clean water as one of the key ambitions and the collaboration between European, local and national governments with research hubs such as the Water Institute, uh, we believe essential if we were to achieve the deal's ultimate goal of making Europe climate neutral by 2050. So now, after those few words of introduction, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Mairead McGuinness. As I said, Mairead is the first Vice President of the European Parliament and represents the, uh, the Midlands Northwest constituency. As first Vice President, she oversees relations with national parliaments, uh, among numerous other responsibilities. She's a member of the Parliament's committees on the environment, agriculture and rural development, uh, public health and food safety, and constitutional affairs. She's a very busy person. In recent years, as a, a member of the Parliament's committee for overseeing the Brexit process, this is AFCO, Maraid has strongly defended uh, EU interests with regular media appearances. And I think I can speak for everybody on this call, uh, Maria, that everyone took great pride in 
the manner in which you actually uh, acted in sometimes very challenging circumstances. And I think you, you reflected the views of all of us in that regard. And we took great pride on that. Um, Maria also chairs the Parliament's working group on, group on the administrative consequences of Brexit. Maria is no stranger to DCU, and indeed I can say uh, that she's been a very good friend to DCU over the years, and I want to express my gratitude uh, to her for that. Uh, Maria, I'm stepping down as president in three weeks' time. So, um, I say over my decade here, I think you've been here many times and you had family connections as well. So, we are very grateful to you um, for this virtual appearance today, given your extremely busy schedule. So, on behalf of DCU and on behalf of the Water Institute, Thank you for joining us, Mairead, and we look forward to hearing from you and to hearing the, the questions that, that follow. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you very much for that introduction and uh, to introduce Mairead McGuinness, our speaker today. And could I invite all of the participants to please put your questions into the chat box and we will look at those in the time allowed after Mairead speaks. So again, thank you, Brian. Delighted to see you. And Mairead, over to you. Well, thank you, uh, Chair, and again, my thanks to DCU and to Brian for those warm words of welcome. And can I just say to Ruth Clinton, who has persisted with trying to arrange for me to physically get to DCU and now to do it uh, virtually, fair play to your resilience and your determination, and we're eventually getting together. And I think what's good is we're probably getting more people tuned into this conversation than if I were physically present. So that's the good news. I just want to say a few things about DCU and, and Breen, good luck with um, the next three weeks and to congratulate you on what you've done for the university because I was aware of your credentials and your global ranking. Um, as you say, two of our four children um, and one currently uh, been to DCU but I go back much further because back in the day um, I studied on the campus when the Ag faculty of UCD uh, went to the Albert College so I have strong connections and I'm still trying to find the photograph of myself and a few students at the very big tree which you've kept and indeed the old building so I have great connections and fondness for the place and indeed what the college has done um, so thank you for your leadership on that and I know these are challenging times for universities um, and I hope that you manage uh, in all of these difficulties to have that experience of students on campus where it's possible and engaging um, with college lecturers and having a life as well because those of us who went to college for though for though we enjoyed the life of college as well as the learning of college and I think we have to connect both of them so good luck with the challenge to all universities uh, in this time ahead. Um, one other point around universities, I've tried in my time here to make sure that Irish scientists, lecturers, experts come to the European Parliament and take part in committee. Uh, implore all of our universities to do that because it's a great way of showing our experience as a country and the expertise we have. But also, it's very good, I think, for universities as well. So I've, I've tried to push that, and I've spoken to a lot of universities around that. So those are my opening remarks. Now let's get to the meat of the subject. And indeed, meat might come up later in the conversation. So a lot of the uh, debate here is around the European Green Deal, which is essentially a way of rebooting our economies and society to be more sustainable. So the work in DCU fits into that entire agenda. Um, but because it's such an enormous plan, um, it has impacts for every single sector of our economy, whether it's energy or agriculture. It just will impact across all of those sectors. Um, it also wants to achieve this idea of sustainability uh, but also looking at fairness um, and making sure that no one is left behind. So it has a great social dimension as well as an economic dimension. And the Green Deal was um, well, if you like, um, flagged before the pandemic. Um, and it was interesting that there were some expectations that perhaps the agenda around the Green Deal might be put off the top shelf in terms of its priority because of the pandemic. But in fact, that hasn't happened. And I think that's been a very positive development. So essentially, the Commission have repeated its determination to push through the Green Deal with the other institutions and with the Member States, because it believes that now is the time to invest in a future that is more sustainable. Of course, we're going to have to find money to do that. So just maybe a word in relation to how this is likely to be funded. Prior to the pandemic, we knew that there would be significant need for public and private investment. We now know that that scale of um, financing is much greater because we would be recovering 
and investing um, at the same time. So you will have heard that there is a, a reorientation of the budget for the European Union. It should kick in by 2021. The details are still not agreed between the member states. But equally, the recovery plan, this next generation EU of 750 billion, which is very significant, um, is a very bold initiative by the President of the Commission, where she is saying to member states, look, we don't want you to contribute more to the budget, but we do need that you will allow the European Union to borrow on the financial markets. And because of the good track record, the AAA rating, we will be able to do so in a very uh, least costly way. And the plan is that this 700 50 would be rolled out in the very early years so hopefully if things happen as soon as 2021 um, so that there will be a stimulus um, to the recovery across the European Union. The money will be targeted at countries who are most in need so clearly you think of Italy and Spain in terms of the direct impact of the pandemic um, and we also think of the families and the bereavement apart from the economic side of this so we're dealing with a very complex and difficult issue. There is a discussion about the scale of grants or loans because the Commission wants to see the bulk of the money going as grants. Uh, which is a very positive um, initiative for the countries that will receive the funding because they don't have to repay. However, somebody will have to repay and this is one of the complex discussions that we're having at the moment. So if we borrow, how do we repay? When do we repay? There's different ideas here in the Parliament about how that should be done and indeed around member states. So we still have the frugal four countries who are not so willing to be generous around this package, but I think you will see movement there because of the need. And those countries who may be frugal will understand that if countries that are impacted by the pandemic cannot buy from them, in other words, if they're in recession or depression, uh, then it impacts the countries uh, that have not been as badly hit. So there is a common interest, if you like, across Europe to make sure that the European economy recovers. So I think we'll see some flexibility there. Um, and then this money, should it come through the phases, will be channeled into the budget where the European Parliament will have a significant role. And I do think the money will be used to target investments for the Green Deal. So every single sector um, will, if you like, have the capacity to uh, receive funding from the Green Deal. I know that Ireland particularly, um, and the Taoiseach has referenced uh, just last week at the Council meeting that he would like to see Ireland's share of the recovery fund increase. And I suppose that's valid, not just around the pandemic, but perhaps also around the uh, potential impact of a no deal Brexit. And there may be questions that people rather may want to ask around that. If we then delve into the, the Green Deal itself, there were two very important strategies launched in recent weeks. One of them, a farm to fork strategy. And I suppose that uh, exemplifies how Europe is looking at the beginning and end and indeed looking at the circular economy. So the farm to fork strategy is a very significant um, proposal. It's a strategy. It doesn't have legislative impact yet, but it is going to be debated here in the Parliament and legislation will follow. And essentially it is taking that supply chain from beginning to end, so consumers and producers, and then input suppliers and seeing what's sustainable, what's not, where do we need to make changes and how do we make those changes. It's also linked to the biodiversity strategy, which is another very important piece of work. And just as a side remark, I have felt that during this pandemic, a lot of people tuned in more to nature than they would have had we not had the experience of this shutdown because people were at home, the weather was pleasant and the people were tuning in. And I think that's been a common theme in other member states as well. So even if you weren't aware of the threat to biodiversity and nature by the way we live, work and play today, I think that many people are more tuned into that now. And I think that's a good thing because we know that species are in decline and we know that habitats are um, under attack and indeed are being removed and are under pressure. So we do need to take action to address that. Um, and we can talk maybe later with the specifics for Ireland, but I think across Europe, there is an understanding that we can't keep going in a linear fashion, extracting resources, uh, producing something from them and dumping them and, and wasting some of the resources in the process. So it is a complex, uh, piece of work and it feeds into this whole idea of the circular economy and I suppose if you reflect on it, it Europe has been doing for some time even around waste collection or or rubbish where I think traditionally somebody would just light a fire in the back garden whereas now I think most people are better tuned in to recycle what they can um, uh, although those who dump waste to the countryside I hope they're 
not tuning in, but if they are, please stop it because I think we have other issues around how people treat um, the countryside and, and what they're prepared to do with it. So the entire focus is on resource uh, efficiency and resource management. science emerging on all of these issues. So in the past, we may not have understood these interactions, um, even around farming practices. Today, we understand that better and the knowledge is being shared. So even though this is going to be a challenge for member states and, and Ireland included, I think it's also a fantastic opportunity. Um, because if you look at our, our food, for example, Irish food is exported globally and in, across Europe. And I think if we want to maintain that level of uh, food production, we are going to have our green credentials checked. And not just a paper rubber stamping check. I think there will be more forensic examination of all supply chains to see what we're doing and whether they are sustainable. Even the fashion industry will be, you know, and is being targeted around this. So it's, it's how we try and engage with citizens. And that's why the work that you do in the cafe is really important around water, which is taken for granted by many of us. Um, and I think it's been interesting, particularly in the pandemic, how Irish water had to warn us to stop wasting water, clearly wash your hands and do it several times because water usage was increasing. But of course, we hadn't much um, uh, water falling by way of rain. And indeed, anyone in the, the, amongst the farming community, I think up until this recent rainfall, which wasn't significant, but at least it helped, were really concerned about the growth of crops and the availability of water, which speaks to the climate change issue. And in this regard, the um, target of achieving climate neutrality by 2050 will be enshrined in European Union law by the end of this year, at least that's the expectation. One of my roles is um, I lead on the climate law legislation, that, that debate and the negotiations for the EPP group. Um, it is, um, if you like, quite optimistic in the sense that Europe is going to legislate for its verbal commitment. So in other words, the European Union wants to lead on climate change and wants to be climate neutral by 2050. We therefore will be looking at if you increasing our target for 2030, currently it's at 40%, that is likely to go up to a minimum of 50, 55%. Some in the house would like that to increase further in line with what um, science is telling us around climate. Um, but the truth is we have from now until 2050 to achieve climate neutrality. And the discussion and the debate is about, you know, do we do that in an exactly phased way? Do we um, do what we can now and then realize that in the latter decade, we will have to do an awful lot? Do we think that the science will evolve in terms of carbon capture? Will we understand better the role of sinks? Um, and in that regard, one of the issues for Ireland is our peatlands. And there's been a lot of announcements about Gordon and Mona um, putting away from um, harvesting of peat. But anyone who drives through that countryside, and I would represent a significant portion of it. I mean, Ireland's 40 shades of green is, is now replaced in that area by dark brown. Um, and it, it's interesting in the uh, reform of, for example, the Common Agriculture Policy, which is also part of this delivery of a more resource efficient and sustainable uh, future. Um, one of the proposals is that there should be a re-wetting of wetlands. And I took part in a very interesting webinar with some German colleagues around this, because we know that that will help us sequester more carbon. However, when I raised this at a farmer's meeting some time back, there was a little bit of anxiety from one particular farmer who, and I understand perfectly his perspective, when he basically ran up to me and said, we have spent generations making land out of this. We drained it and indeed Europe encouraged drainage. And now you're telling us we have to reverse all that. So there are sensitive issues about how we navigate the change that is required in society. Because if you look at what Europe did, and I'm old enough again to remember very well, when we joined the European Union and that time of expansion of agriculture and the mantra in those decades and I hope some of you remember the RTE program landmark which I would have featured on as a very novice and young reporter but we were encouraging farmers to rip out hedgerows and make the fields bigger and this was public service broadcasting so it was obviously part of public policy we were encouraging and showing different ways of draining land and we were also saying, let on the input. So the, so the drive of public policy in that decade is very different than the public policy of today. So uh, I'm happy to see that Ear to the Ground, which I formerly worked on many, many years ago, is still thriving. And on that program, and one of the first reports I did 
1993 was about the establishment of the EPA. Uh, and it's interesting to see how the work of the Protection Agency, the Environmental Protection Agency, has evolved over time and how we have really accepted that environmental issues are core. They're not separate from anything. The part and parcel of everything we do. So that's been a very interesting time. Um, and I think a lot of the changes that will be required of all of us is around managing change. I think a lot of people accept that we need to change, but it can be difficult to alter our habits. Um, so when it comes to recycling, I'm always hugely impressed in schools um, where children are very tuned in to recycling and, and not wasting water and turning off taps but perhaps their grandparents aren't, or indeed their parents aren't. So in one sense, we have to use a younger generation that's more tuned into these issues to, if you like, help us in achieving our targets. And in that regard, the climate movement, uh, the Thunberg and the protests that have been happening around climate have jolted the politics as well, because there is a generation who are very fearful of the planet's existence, which is quite a, I think it's quite sad that so many young people are afraid of that and, and worried about the future. It wasn't a, something that we worried about, uh, when I was a child, we had many other worries, I'm sure. Uh, but I think it is resonating in the politics, um, as it should. And you know, even if climate change wasn't a problem, which clearly it is, there are many things in our strategies in the Green Deal, which make sense, which are, are just wise. There are lots of things in the biodiversity strategy about leaving habitats that are sound and, and should be done. Um, and again, sometimes our policy initiatives uh, at EU level and national level have, if you like, worked against that basic common sense. So there are payments for farmers through the Common Agricultural Policy, but very often in our definition of what land is eligible, um, those habitats which are very rich in public goods are deducted. So essentially a farmer, uh, you know, thinking about the money end would logically say, well, if that acre of ground would get me a payment, I'm going to put it into a condition where the payment will be eligible and I get the money um, and therefore destroy a habitat. So again, we're looking at our own uh, response and how we have, if you like, framed policy in the past and how we need to be different today. And I think there is a good climate around achieving these things, although I think there's a lot of worry as well because of the economic pressure, that if we're trying to do um, and work to a, the Green Deal, that it will, if you like, have severe impacts. I'm thinking of you know, vulnerable families, I'm thinking of an older generation that may not have anything other than a fossil fuel fireplace and therefore need to use that. There's a big debate here about subsidizing fossil fuels, but one of the things we do in Ireland is obviously support through um, payments to older people um, buying fossil fuels. And you have to question yourself, well, is that a good use of money? Or if you remove it, do you then impact the most vulnerable in a, in a very direct way? And we're also looking at the issue around just transitions. So for regions of Ireland and elsewhere that will be impacted very profoundly, the just transition and indeed the amount of money for it would be hugely significant, I think, in encouraging buy-in. Because I think if, if those who are very impacted don't see a buy-in from, um, uh, by way of support, financial and other, then I think we're not going to get the change we need. I want to finish, um, because I'm not sure of my timing, uh, with just a, a remark around our water situation in Ireland. Um, and if you look at the EPA website and at what Irish Water is saying and what Chagask is doing, there's an incredible body of information available on all of those uh, platforms, which I try to, to look at. And clearly when it comes to uh, the treatment of sewage, we have a big issue. Um, I mean, it's quite staggering. And I was a little bit shocked myself that, and I'll quote the EPA, that the equivalent of 78,000 people, the sewage of 78,000 people flows into the environment every day from 35 towns and villages. Um, and, and that is quite a you know, shocking statistic. We know that when it comes to investments, um, Irish Water is working to achieve, um, if you like, its targets, but, but not doing so. So there is a big issue there about how we can, if you like, uh, stop this, because clearly when raw sewage goes into a water or a body, it flows and impacts and has devastating consequences. So I think that is an issue for us. 
I think in more a personal view than anything else that because we don't pay for water in domestic settings, um, we tend to you know be careless around taps dripping or power showers or all of these things. So I think we do need an awareness and education program in Ireland about the realities of water that don't take it for granted. Um, I was delighted. There's a small river on a piece of land where we farm. And for the first time in a long time, I saw fish jumping out of the water um, and lots of them in this water body. And I was absolutely delighted to see that because it spoke to better water quality. But I was also aware that in one of the rivers that this small river would flow into, that there were farmers extracting water because of the drought situation. So we're going to have a challenge here about our water resource and access to it. Um, we perhaps think of droughts being a problem elsewhere, in Spain, etc. But they're, they're going to be issues for us here, as are floods. Um, so just to say that one of the things that's actually going through committee at the moment, and if anyone is interested, you might contact me, contact me rather afterwards by way of uh, email, um, there is a motion for resolution on implementation of the EU water legislation. And I think this would be really important in terms of what we will ask the Commission to do and what member states need to do. And if I look at some of the issues that are highlighted in this report, it is around um, raw sewage going into water. It is around the fact that one third of European countries suffer from water scarcity. And that hydropower plants, there's 21,000 of them, um, but there are questions around uh, their impact on the environment and indeed around the question of dam removals. Um, there are other issues contained in it about hydropower stations, which provide the largest share of renewable energy in Europe. Uh, but that the again the construction of dams can negatively impact on habitats um, and that is i suppose everything we do will probably find a downside but we have to min minimize those risks particularly when it comes to water the quality of it the availability of it um, and the habitats that it supports and this uh, uh, resolution will speak to that we expect it to be voted, I think, in the autumn uh, when we're back in plenary. So there is time for those who would be interested in it to perhaps, you know, give us some suggestions around amendments. And I might share it with Ruth and uh, with the DCU Water Cafe so that you can help disseminate what's on the table currently and what might be useful by way of changes to it. And there's other ideas around reusing discarded quarries for water storage, etc., etc. Uh, although I'm minded uh, to my dear grandmother when a barrel was left out to collect rainwater and where washing her hair with rainwater was the thing. So, you know, we may, might look at some of uh, what people did in the past to guide us in the future, um, because sometimes the past we left behind would give us good directions for doing things better today. And lastly, just to say that, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, paperwork, there's a lot of things to read and the complexity of the Green Deal may get lost, but to my mind, it's extremely straightforward. It's about doing things much better today, doing it in a circular way, understanding how all of our actions impacts um, on just about everything and that we, we move towards this Green Deal in order to be more sustainable in the long term and not to harm the very environment that we all live in. And I think that's you know absolutely crucial that we all stick to that. And the Programme for Government uh, has a very big section on water, which I'm sure you're very well aware of. And I think that's hugely important as well. Um, although let's see what happens on Friday. So on that note, I'm going to wind up with those reflections and thoughts. And I look forward to both comments and questions because I want to learn from this exercise as well as give some information. So thank you very much. Well, Mairead, and um, I just would ask everybody to use their reaction to give her a clap, if you can. I think there's various claps happening around the place. So thank you so much for that. Um, that's the first time I've done that, actually. But... <laughs> <laughs> it's the first time I've seen it. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. And without further ado, I want to work through the comments and questions, and there are quite a few. Uh, so what I'm going to do is kind of work through them just for a minute, um, Mairead, and give you a sense of the questions and then you can respond. And if we want more detail later, we can share the questions with you. So first of all, uh, this is from Samantha Fahi, uh, who is our own uh, sustainability manager on the campus, actually. Um, she writes, as a public sector university, we've undertaken a full carbon footprint of all our activities to help us identify our uh, greenhouse gas emissions and have identified that transport emission 
from commuting are larger than our combined electricity and gas related emissions, but that procurement is the largest element of our greenhouse gas emissions. Many of the measures we have identified to reduce our impact require investment. Will there be further directives to help support the implementation of changing the current business as usual model? Okay, I'm going to leave that with you just for a moment. Um, Susan Hegarty, who actually heads up our citizen science initiatives in, in the Water Institute, uh, has said engaging people and citizens is key. As you say, we need to have buy-in. Uh, you have been exemplary in communicating the environmental message over the years. Any suggestions on how we can communicate effectively with the general public beyond schools in relation to things like putting phosphates onto land, how, we can, how these can get into water, disposing of household contaminants, etc., as well as trying to change people's perception of wasteland? Okay. Uh, again, I'm going to leave that with you. and I'm just going to give you a flavour and you can come back to those. Um, Louis has uh, written, are there any proposed solutions uh, to who will pay for greenhouse gases, uh, the consumer or the producer? And actually that is also reflected by Matthew Jacobs, okay. uh, who says um, Ireland has been incentivized to produce goods for the EU uh, that have all, uh, adversely impacted the environment. The cost of mitigating these impacts is being pushed back onto farmers and wastewater treatment companies who are providing these goods and services. Is the Green Deal looking at ways to push these costs to other parties to allow for the implementation of new innovative practices? Great question. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> I'm going to keep going just for a moment. There's a couple more mm -hmm. questions and then, uh, so Pat Brereton, um, he asks, how can Irish water be reimagined to ensure buy-in from all sections of the community in Ireland. And I think that issue uh, question comes up again in relation to communication. Uh, Ruth Clinton asked, will there be difficulties to getting buy-in from farming communities? And uh, there's, an, there's a question again in relation to buy-in, another question around behavioural change, um, bottom-up behavioural change regarding climate change at all levels needs top-down system systemic and legal policy change approaches. This is especially true for farmers and other high CO2 emitters. And um, there's a question here in relation to uh, the soil, you mentioned soil quality, and the FAO actually have regarded soil as being mm. critical to the water energy for the nexus. And I suppose, how does the Green Deal look at this? And I might just um, leave it there. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> If you don't mind, and just give us a flavour of responses for now, and you know we can get some more detailed comments if you wish later. Okay, well I'm glad I was going to pull the plug on your microphone there because there's so many questions, but they're all very pertinent. So thank you for them. And um, so around the um, you know the idea of transport being the biggest, if you like, factor in DCU, it'd be interesting to see how we as a society. Um, move when this pandemic hopefully is under control. Will people still commute? Will we use local hubs to work in? And I think there's a lot of work to be done around that issue. I think for universities in particular, I mean, we were having this conversation off air, if you like, that a big part of universities being with lots of people from all over the place coming together. And I think you, we need to allow for that. So um, perhaps not have students commuting as much, but certainly ha allowing them to have the experience. And I think it's very good that your college is looking at these issues um, in a very direct way. Um, in terms of the general point about who pays, because this is a, a complex one. In general, Europe uses the principle of the polluter pays. So we have, for example, and I joined in this morning, a debate around the emissions trading system, the price of carbon, and big emitters have to pay for what they do. So that's been the general principle. I think there's a, a separate issue to be thought about um, around payment for public goods. So I mentioned issues around habitats. Um, so when I buy food, have I any idea that this food is coming from an environment that actually respects habitats, has good water quality, has all of those things? Um, I have a view, and I've been pursuing this with some effect um, over recent years, is that the for when it comes to food, that if you look at, even today, if you open a newspaper, there's full page ads about cheaper, cheaper, cheaper food. And clearly affordability is, a, is an issue. So we have to take into account the affordability. But there is, in my view, a perverse, if you like, signaling back to producer level. If a producer is required to produce more 
um, at a price that's not really sustainable for them? Can they or will they look after all of these things that we want them to look after? So we did have legislation go through here at my insistence around unfair trading practices, which is a very early and small chink about addressing this. I think there's an incoherency sometimes between competition policy and environment policy and agriculture policy. I haven't cracked that yet because the competition people here in the commission are very strict about their rule. But I think we will, as a, as a society, think more about it. So I, I've been told here by some of my assistants that in Brussels there are very um, new shops around organic supplies where you can go without bringing packaging, etc. It's for a certain market, but at least it's, it's beginning. Uh, so that's a general comment around pricing, and I suppose it relates to this idea of farmers, and that was mentioned. One of the things that it might be interesting to provoke a conversation on is that in Ireland, we obviously have a big agriculture sector. 30% uh, of emissions come from agriculture. In Europe, it's 10%. Uh, but the commissioner are always stressing that of that, 70% of that 10% comes from livestock, uh, production. So um, we had a hearing yesterday with the Environment Commissioner and he very much said that you know we need to um, stop eating, not stop eating meat, but certainly reduce meat consumption. That's a big challenging issue if you talk to a farming audience and doesn't help them buy into what we're trying to do. So I think we need to be a little bit careful around that issue because indeed some of the land on which cattle would be kept in Ireland, and I'm thinking of parts of my own constituency, you wouldn't grow anything else on it other than grass and extensive livestock. Um, so I think we need to be careful about generalized advice and then specific per location. Uh, the question on reimagining Irish water um, and getting buy-in, I suppose we all went through a terrible trauma way back and those who remember the uh, European and local elections of 2014 or nine. 14, I think. I clearly don't remember the date, but I remember the experience. And it was particularly tough. So for political reasons, we have the structure we have. I think Irish Water, and my experience of dealing with them has been excellent. Um, but I think they're challenged by the enormity of the task. I mean, the amount of, of pipes that are leaking, uh, the remedial work that's required. I mentioned the sewage treatment plants, although I got a nice email saying that the treatment plant to my closest town in RD is been upgraded and the work is done so that's positive and um, so I, I, I haven't really heard much of a debate from the public about Irish water I think once the issue of paying for water domestically went off the agenda for those on the public supply I think water isn't on the agenda as it needs to be and maybe we need to talk about how, through your work in, in DCU, that could be changed. I mentioned the polluter pays principle as I check my notes here, and I think that is the principle that will be held to. Um, and then citizens' engagement beyond schools. Yeah, there's, there's an awful lot of good stuff going on in schools, and sometimes we ask schools to do too much. I know that uh, retirement groups or men's sheds, they're also a focus for these kinds of conversations. Um, but I think uh, my sense of it, and I've been in the parliament here since 2004 that these issues are inescapable and that gradually everybody's getting tuned in now they may be angry about what they think is going too far but i get a sense in which most people understand that we cannot keep raiding um, resources, raiding nature, raiding the environment without damaging consequences. And I suppose there are then the questions of, so how do we change, which is the Green Deal agenda? How do we do that to make it stick so that it isn't just a, a, we change for a bit, that we make it more sustainable? And on that point, I think some of our agri-environment schemes, some have worked, but I would have a concern that what they do if they're for four years, five years, whatever is, they change behavior in that time frame, but very often when the money goes, the habitat goes. So I think we're going to have to be a little bit more subtle around how we manage this. I've made the point publicly on many occasions that we need a more holistic approach to um, all systems, but particularly farm advisory systems, so that the issues around environment are part and parcel of production advice. We have very good experts in all of these, so it's not impossible to do it. But I suppose in general, when somebody is either expanding an enterprise, it's about output. But actually, to do that output piece for the long term, you need to look at all the other factors as well. So I think that needs a discussion, and I'd be interested to hear what your views are on it. Um, I think I've covered most of the main points here. I suppose I am a little concerned that when it comes to water, that we're not talking enough about it. Um, I mentioned my previous life as a reporter, and I remember when um, 
silage pits. I'm aging myself beyond my own recognition here. I'm owning up to too many years. But there was a time when, you know, the advice was just put it on the slope so that the effluent would be able to, to run off. Now we know that that's just not on and that it doesn't happen and we've tidied up farmyards through environment schemes and there's greater awareness we have the catchment area programs buy-in from farmers and you know sometimes it's peer-to-peer -peer that if you have a group together and somebody is doing something really interesting and somebody hears about it in that group it, it influences so i think you have to use an awful lot of different um, mechanisms and groups in order to make progress but above all else, I mean, the climate agenda is really where we're at here. Everything feeds into that. And I don't think it can escape any of us that climate is changing. Um, older people will tell you that. We know that ourselves. Um, and I think if we have any respect for nature or even for handing on the world um, to a next generation, we just have to change and we have to do it rather rapidly. And we have to do it in a way that leaves nobody behind and doesn't alienate communities. It is easier said than done. Yeah. I mean, that's a really important point that you make is around, you know, the complexity of the challenge that is there. Leaving no one behind means actually taking all of the stakeholders' interests, uh, you know, on, on board. Thank you for those responses. There's a couple of more points that came in that I think are worth uh, mentioning. And I am conscious that we are going to finish at 10 to, uh, 10 to 12. Um, Alec Rolston, uh, just on the communication uh, piece, Alec Rolston has told us that Anfara Mishka has a statutory role to help increase awareness and support education initiatives around water, water, water conservation and the social value of water. And he's very happy to engage with yourself and others mm -hmm. on the call this morning uh, to examine the behaviour and attitudes to wa towards water. And indeed, he has uh, recently done a water cafe with us and they have a huge amount to offer in terms of that communication piece. Thanks, Alex, Alex for that. Uh, Blonet White, um, uh, an assistant professor in the, the School of Chemical Sciences, uh, who works in the space of uh, biodiversity, she says, looking at how current ag policy focuses on quantity of semi-natural habitat, what are the possibilities within the Green Deal to allow that focus to move more toward quality of semi-natural semi habitat, which should, be support, which should support biodiversity and natural mm -hmm. capital? And just very last point um, <clears throat> by uh, Dara Murphy. Uh, Maraith, great presentation, very informative, thanks to you. Uh, as mentioned, there's information, advice and support for both business and consumers on water conservation at www.water.ie, so Irish Water. Uh, and we also have much more detail on projects across the country, um, wastewater projects which are a priority, and we've seen some real positive outcomes as part of a working group which focuses on community engagement and cross-stakeholder on pesticides working at community level with farmers and local government and local organizations that have seen real improvements. So nice, a great comment there. And just one last point in relation to pesticides uh, in the Green Deal itself, one of the, uh, the, the positive impacts for, for water quality relates to removal of pesticides and mm. herbicides. And I just wonder about the lobby, pesticide lobby, and how actually you overcome that, that big pesticide lobby in relation to reduction of those. So, in the last couple of minutes, Marie, I'm not sure if you want to just close up just with some final yeah. comments. Okay, how much time have I? Because I have a watch that doesn't work. Three minutes. Three. Three. Oh my God. Okay, several things I should have mentioned and thank you for the comments and then to the specifics around um, communication. I, I really appreciate that. One of the issues that we're looking at is reducing the use of fertilizers and um, pesticides and the targets are quite high. But I think we have to look then at technologies, other technologies to allow crops to be grown. Cereal farmers in Ireland are furious about tools being taken away. But for example, when it comes to free trade agreements, we allow imported grains that have used the banned products. Um, so there's a conflict in policy, and I've mentioned this several times. I wanted to mention nature-based solutions because I'd never forgive myself if I didn't use the words. And um, because an awful lot of what were the problems we have could be tackled by just allowing nature do her thing. And I think we need to talk more about that when it comes to habitats. Uh, there's a good point around quality uh, versus quantity. Um, and I think that's about a communication piece as well and trying to get an understanding as to why do no harm, leave it alone. I had a row of a couple of the lawns at home. I won and so they did, they did the dandelions. But it's a small thing, but we've all been geared to have everything ship shape and neat and tidy. And we have to remember that in fact, we need to go the opposite. 
So, you know, for people with gardens, you need to stop spraying because you don't need to leave the weeds when they're there. It's, it's a very different mindset and it does need action. And the other point I, I neglected was that remember, we're also looking at green finance. And ultimately, this, in my view, is how um, we will tackle all of the problems I've discussed. If the investors realize that stakeholders are not happy with investing in coal and uh, oil and all of that kind of thing, and some are already pulling away, then this whole idea around identifying projects that are green and targeting green finance in that direction will solve a lot of our problems. Because in a sense, the market has created the problems of today because it's linear. You know, it's you borrow, you build, you sell, etc. Whereas now we're thinking a little bit more strategically. Um, and I think that we are going to see a rollout of that amongst, um, you know, corporates that may have just paid lip service in the past to this idea, but will now have to actually deliver on it. And I think the combination of the many things we have discussed with this uh, investment agenda around green and not investing in old and damaging technologies is, I suppose, the most important brick in this wall, because without that, you know, investors might just go for the immediate. I don't think they'll be as inclined to do that now. So I think those are really important issues. In my final sentence, what I would like to say is that I'm very aware that there are many more experts in the area of water listening to me than I am expert. But I am a good conduit for the best of uh, knowledge that you have. And I would ask that anyone who has specific interest in this area would send us an email. Um, I know Katie might say, my God, not too many, please, but we do want connection. We like the idea that you would, with your expertise, feed into our work here. And in so doing, we just spread uh, knowledge um, and just get everybody bought into it. Um, yes, I'm, <laughs> well done, Katie. Two other things. Um, this is EU Sustainable Energy Week, so there's a lot of talk around energy and the water access there. I didn't mention marine and the potential for carbon uh, sequestration and carbon sinks in that area. That's something you might uh, add to the conversation when you're relying to us. The EU is launching a hydrogen strategy that will be interesting around water as well. We didn't speak anything or enough about it. And I suppose, and I'm glad, thank you, Katie, for reminding me of, we had a debate with the president of the... Um, it was the Marshall Islands, wasn't it? And he spoke about the fact that they, they're, as a community, are, I mean, they'll be gone if the world does not tackle climate change. They will just be submerged. And she was very passionate and very strong. And I mean, I did have more than a sense of guilt about how slow we are to change. So we have good reason to do it. We are the richest globally. We, there's no excuse as far as not to do it. And the rest of the world, I hope, will follow. I am a bit worried about the geopolitics globally and big players not acting in the way they used to, but I don't think it's a reason for Europe to stand back. I think we have to move forward and we move forward with academic expertise and the experts who are tuning in. So thank you for the opportunity and I hope it's of some value uh, to your wider conversations and your work. Thank you most sincerely. Wow, Marie, thank you so much. And please, could we have the reaction again, the clapping? I, I want everybody to do that because it really was a stimulating, energetic and filled conversation. Mairead, we have to have you back. There was <laughs> so much in there. I'm just enthused and inspired. Thank you so much indeed. And thank you. There's great comments through coming through from all of the visiting um, guests on the, on the call. And this really has been a fantastic experience for us. So we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Maraith, from us here at the Institute, from Dublin City University, and indeed from your friends in Ireland. Uh, best, best of luck and please stay safe and keep washing those hands. <laughs> I will, but don't waste water. Don't Thanks waste. very much. Thank Thanks, you Maraith. Thank you. Thank you. Gromagas, Brian. Lan, Gromagas. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Thanks to everybody. Brianna. Well done. Slán. Slán.